at Sober.org, a sober living environment using permaculture, arts and crafts, peer-to-peer support, medicinal cannabis to help get off of alcohol, drugs, and prescription medications. Away from the crowds where water and sky are clear, a spiritual awakening beckons. Guest chefs nourish you. Natural therapeutic benefits at Wilbur Hot Springs. WilburHotSprings.com The question that has been in my mind for 50 years is why is the United States government suppressing research into certain medicines while at the same time allowing research into other medicines? Welcome to Mind, Body, Health, and Politics and Mendocino TV. I'm your host, Dr. Richard Miller. Today, we are live streaming the MAPS, Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies book launch of Dr. Stan Groff's latest book, The Visionary World of H.R. Geiger. Today's program, entitled Psychedelic Art Gallery, Modern Consciousness Research and the Understanding of Art. We bring you this live stream as part of our new audio video platform, psychopedia.org, which was created to bring you the latest research in psychedelic medicines. Thanks in large part to the leadership of Dr. Rick Doblin, founder of MAPS, we are experiencing a rebirth of scientific research in psychedelic medicines. This renaissance will help shape the public's perception and demonstrate the potential of psychedelics as medicines for healing and as catalysts for waking up to the profound issues facing our society. Tonight, hundreds will gather here at the Bentley Reserve in San Francisco to hear from pioneering research psychiatrist and author, Dr. Stan Groff, who led many of the earliest experiments with LSD in the 1960s and went on to found holotropic breathing and the Spiritual Emergency Network. Dr. Groff's work into human consciousness teaches us how to integrate alternate realities for consciousness expansion, creativity, and optimal well-being. In this presentation, you'll also hear Dr. Rick Dablin, the founder of MAPS, again, the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies, whom I've interviewed on Mind, Body, Health, and Politics multiple times. Psychopedia features the full interviews and clips of Rick and I discussing research related to MDMA, Ibogaine, marijuana, LSD, and more. All of my interviews with national experts on psychedelic medicines have been indexed by substance and topics on psychopedia.org. Psychopedia and MAPS are part of a global shift in consciousness that is now taking place with respect to the war on drugs, suppression of research into psychedelics, and how we treat one another as fellow humans on this planet. We need and are here requesting your help to expand this conversation to our global audience using the internet to disseminate this research in as efficient a manner as possible. Following this research, I encourage you to visit psychopedia.org, mindbodyhealthpolitics.org, maps.org, and sign up for our monthly newsletters. I hope you very much enjoy tonight's educational and entertaining seminar. Uh, and um, as you'll say, I was uh, deeply inspired by Stan Groff's work and uh, the, all of the research that's happening now to focus on psychedelic therapy. Uh, the whole community that's grown up has really been uh, a great deal in part inspired by transpersonal psychology and uh, the early work that Stan did. 
So uh, without further ado, I'd like to introduce Rick Doblin. Um, Rick, you may want to come around back here to avoid stumbling over things. Um, and I just want to thank Rick very specifically for the work he's been doing for the last 30 years with MAPS. Um, MAPS, yeah. MAPS started very, very small and it has turned it into uh, something that allowed potential and community support. So thank you, Rick, and thank you all for being here. Yeah, the, the hardest part of these events for me is uh, wearing the suit. <laughs> um, I, I first off would like to um, uh, thank Brian Brown, who is the MAP staff person that put the most work into creating this event. And uh, uh, all the other MAP staff that have, have really helped make this happen. Um, for me, it's been just a um, long odyssey. We talk about MAPS is um, 1986, and next year will be our 30th anniversary. But really, it all came together for me um, in 1972. And it, it's a particular pleasure to be here at a launch of a book that uh, MAPS is publishing that Stan has uh, written because it was really a book of stands that helped me to decide what I wanted to do with my life. And that was when I was uh, 18 years old and I had done a lot of um, LSD at college <laughs> and decided that uh, really the, the inner world, that I had been trained so much in uh, the intellectual um, sort of rational world, but that I was really out of balance, drastically out of balance in the LSD helped me see that and, and also gave me a, a feeling like maybe there was a, a path towards a greater integration, but it was very, very difficult. And I went to the guidance counselor at my college, new college in Sarasota, Florida, and this was a different era. The guidance counselor actually said, well, it's interesting what you're doing and you might want to read this manuscript copy of Realms of the Human Unconscious by Stan Groff. And I was just, you know, First off, to be able to have an honest conversation with a guidance counselor at college about your LSD use and why it was leading you to want to drop out, and for him to, to actually give me this book. And so reading um, Realms of the Human Unconscious was for me the, uh, the crystallization of a path forward that involved science and spirituality and a certain implication of, of values, and most importantly, it had the reality testing aspect of therapy. This was all about how do we help human beings who are struggling in their lives have um, a more open and relaxed attitude so that they can participate more in life, and that there can be great knowledge about um, religion, spirituality, neuroscience, but it's put to the test, can we use it to help people feel better? And that all came to me right after the sort of massive backlash, the massive crackdown that happened in, the, in our culture. And I was um, feeling like, here's a way to move forward. And once I recognized that this was a way to move forward, even though this had all been shut down, I thought, okay, this is a life's work. I'm going to try to uh, bring, bring this back and also work on my own therapy and then one day try to become a psychedelic therapist. So that's, that's still my uh, life path. It's just taken me a, a long time to get to uh, uh, becoming a psychedelic therapist. It'll happen after we've made MDMA into a prescription medicine. And to be... <laughs> And, you know, maybe um, Stan will even be around to uh, do some therapy legally again as well. <laughs> um, so what, what, I, what I'd like to do today is just briefly give you a, an overview of what MAPS is doing and why. And so I think the, the most important thing for me to begin with is, you know, the, the struggle that 
we saw in the psychedelic 60s and that we um, tried to understand what was going on. I was a, a draft resistor for the Vietnam War. I was planning to um, uh, anticipating going to jail for that. And it made me really think about how it is that the incredible technology that we have, the incredible ability to try to support ever greater uh, billions and billions of people on this planet, and, and yet we're so immersed in these uh, very regressive kind of struggles where it feels as if uh, individuals and whole nations are mentally insane and, and doing certain kind of um, ways in which people identify as um, in more limited ways than we really are. And those kind of identifications in these limited ways cause us to have uh, fears and anxieties about the other. And it felt to me like the solution for this kind of um, separateness would be this understanding, but not just a, a mental understanding, but an experiential, profound experiential sense of our connection. And I think that was really what, when I look back on what happened in the 60s, a lot of people think it was because psychedelics went wrong and people had all these bad experiences and some people went crazy and some people um, you know, committed, you know, used these for nefarious ends and that, that it was the reaction against psychedelics going bad and that's what caused this crackdown. But I, I actually think that it was because of what happens when psychedelics go right and people then have a deeper sense of our connection and that causes us to question the limited ways that we've identified as to who we are and to who is us and who is the other. And, and, and so the, the profound way to actually help people feel this, and it's been true through thousands of years, is this mystical experience, this profound sense of, of unity. And the, that has political implications. And so while it was about the, the doorway through the culture was as medicine, as therapy, for me, there's a broader mission, which is to really embed psychedelics as one option among many for people in a, in a mainstream way to have these deep spiritual experiences. And that I think that is in our increasingly globalized world where we're bumping against other cultures, we're bumping against other religions, the fundamentalists are really having a hard time keeping their perspective um, and believing that that's the one right only way. And so we see a lot of reactions, a lot of like, it might look like uh, the fundamentalists are sort of rising in power, but, but it actually is like, I think, this ending of this uh, separateness. And so for me, this idea was confirmed. And, and I want to um, first off say that I, I sat in the back testing it out. I see that not everybody can really see the PowerPoint. So I'm going to pretty much say what, what's on the slides, but I will keep showing it for those people that can see it. But this idea that the mystical experience has fundamental political implications was really confirmed for me by Robert Mueller, who wrote this book in 1983, uh, New Genesis, Shaping the Global Spirituality. Robert Mueller was the Assistant Secretary General of the United Nations, considered to be like the mystic of the United Nations. And he, he wrote this book about how we have um, the United Nations to mediate conflicts between nations, but actually deeper than those conflicts are, are religious conflicts. And if we could have a united uh, a forum for people from different religions to come together, that that could be the vehicle for the next step. And he felt like, the, and Stan has pointed this out too, that the mystics of the different religions are closer to each other than they are to the fundamentalists of their own religion. And so if we can sort of build a culture that's appreciative of this mystical experience. And the, again, psychedelics aren't the only way to do this, but for, for myself and for many others, they've been the way that, that has actually worked. Whereas a lot of our traditional um, rites of passage and traditional religions aren't doing this as much anymore for people. Maybe in the past they have, but now they're not. And so Robert Miller wrote this book and I, I wrote him a letter and uh, I felt like I was somebody um, who was stranded on a desert island and I put a little note in a bottle and you know threw it off 
into the ocean and, and, you know, he wrote me back. It was kind of a, a shock. And he said he believed in um, what I was trying to say to him, that, that his book didn't mention psychedelics, but that we should research it. And he offered to help to bring psychedelic research back and referred me to a series of mystics from different religions to whom I sent MDMA <laughs> when it was still legal. And based on uh, their reports back to Robert Mueller, he ended up um, really providing a, a crucial introduction for me to people at the WHO when they were thinking of criminalizing MDMA internationally. So the idea I'm just trying to say here is that while it is true that we are a nonprofit pharmaceutical company trying to medicalize psychedelics and marijuana, that is not the end goal in terms of cultural change. That I think we really need to embed these tools as religious freedom, personal freedom, and that I think the route that MAPS is taking is trying to lead that. So we're not trying to create a medical priesthood where the only way you get access to these is through your you know, doctor or your pharmacy, but that, that there's this deeper approach. And, and that is going to require a lot more social change, a lot more um, under, a uh, lot, lot more removal of the whole system of prohibition, which is going to take decades more. But that I think this is the end goal. So I, I wanted to share that that's the bigger vision. Um, You know, it's also a human right. I think um, individuals have the human right to explore their own consciousness. And it's the underlying freedom of thought that's beneath the freedom of speech, the freedom to express, the freedom of assembly, that it's the freedom of thought, and that it's a fundamental human right. And this was an article in the MAPS Bulletin by the Libra Foundation, uh, Jennifer Neer. This is the uh, first articulation by a funding philanthropic uh, foundation of the connection between supporting psychedelic research and human rights. And I thought it was just really remarkable that, that this was something that um, is starting to be recognized. So now this is just uh, very quick to show you that um, this is a chart of uh, the last 40 years and the attitudes towards legalization of marijuana. So um, it, it starts out in, in 1970 where it's really 84% um, of people are against the legalization and 12% are in favor. And several years ago it crossed this line, 50% are now, more than 50% of American voters are in favor of marijuana legalization. And for those of you that, that really can't see the chart, what I want to say here is that things were mostly stable starting in the late 1970s when we had the rise of the parents movement we had the nancy reagan just say no things were very stable the that was like a second backlash and for about 20 years up until 1996 attitudes didn't change and starting in 96 attitudes did change and what when we look at that what really happened in 1986 1996 i mean it was the medical marijuana initiative passing here in california and in arizona and it's the medicalization of marijuana that has changed people's attitudes towards legalization. And exit polling has been done on the marijuana voters at the legalization initiatives, and it finds that one of the most important factors as to whether somebody is in favor of marijuana legalization is if they know a medical marijuana patient. Because there's so much misinformation, there's, it's so hard to say what to really believe. But if you know somebody directly, that causes you to question everything that you've been taught, and it causes you to reevaluate risks and benefits. So I think in the same pattern that we are gonna find that the medicalization of psychedelics is gonna change people's attitudes towards the broader use of psychedelics outside of strict medical contexts. And uh, so here it is that, um, I'm going to try to briefly show, this was 1984, this is a picture of, um, my, I'm in the background there, this picture of me um, spying on the DEA. Um, this, this, is, <laughs> this is right before I walked into the door, this is after uh, DEA uh, decided to criminalize ecstasy. They had no idea that um, the therapeutic use of MDMA under the code name Adam had been going on since the middle 70s. 
And they saw the use of ecstasy in public settings, in recreational settings, and then went to criminalize that. And so we had been able to quietly, this therapeutic community had been able to quietly prepare for this, partially through Robert Mueller and his connections and other ways. And so what, um, what I am trying to say is we're going to move from this, 1984, where I'm about to walk in the door to engage the DEA in a lawsuit that we won temporarily through the administrative law judge and then lost because the DEA rejected the recommendation. Um, two, an image, this was the negative images of the DEA on what is ecstasy and predatory drugs. This is what's the DEA's website, Dancing with Darkness. Uh, then we get to um, Oprah, who uh, broadcast a show that was incredibly effective all over the world in scaring people about MDMA. This was a, a fake image of uh, holes in the brain coming from supposedly using MDMA. This is a spec scan. And, and what they did is spec scan shows the blood flow in the brain. And hotter colors are generally more flow, cooler colors are less flow. So what they did here is they just took an arbitrary cutoff and said blood flow below this certain level, we're just going to show as a whole. <laughs> and it was quite uh, scary and effective. People still believe that uh, we've seen this. I've talked to people all over the world who talked about MDMA causing um, holes in the brain. Um, but then, um, 10 years later, um, O Magazine, Oprah did a story on uh, MDMA. This was sort of uh, Oprah's atonement for the prior uh, misinformation. And during this, she had her reporter actually um, she gave permission for her reporter to work to meet an underground psychedelic therapist and take MDMA and write about it. And it was just fantastic. And so this was now the image of MDMA as a magic pill, one dose, you know, magic pill cures your life. So this is propaganda in the positive side because it's MDMA assisted psychotherapy. It's, you know, rarely one dose miracle cure, but, you know, you know, if I had to choose between this and holes in the brain, <laughs> I'd take this one. Uh, but then this is where we really want to get to sales of prescription uh, GMP MDMA. And this image, uh, this image, oops, that image. Okay, so that, that's the goal. So how are we going to get there, briefly? Um, well, um, we have developed a plan, and we have been working on this plan since 2000. And uh, two, actually 2000 is when we started the first study with MDMA for post-traumatic stress disorder in Spain. It was shut down uh, two years later for political reasons by the Spanish anti, the Madrid Anti-Drug Authority. We couldn't overcome it. And then starting in 2004, we were able to uh, start research here in the United States. So this is just to show that, uh, um, and I'd like to thank Amy Emerson, who is our director of clinical research, who came from Novartis. And, so, and she, she developed this uh, highly complicated plan. It, it expands out to multiple pages, you know, loads and loads of steps. But the important point is that we are on track to developing MDMA into medicine by 2021. Now, part of it, one of the things that you may have heard about how uh, the criticisms about the legalization of marijuana is that we don't want big uh, American capitalism, like big tobacco and big alcohol, having control over marijuana. And there's concerns that when you have sort of unbridled American capitalism, that it's going to um, ignore social costs. And so we've started trying to think, well, how do we want to anticipate and envision and imagine MDMA as a prescription medicine? Do we want it to be like the pharmaceutical companies just trying to maximize sales and maximize profits. And our answer to that is no, that, that we want to roll this out in a socially responsible way so that it doesn't cause a backlash. And selling MDMA as a prescription medicine is not a nonprofit endeavor. Doing the research to make MDMA into a medicine is a nonprofit thing. But once you have it as a business, it's something that you should be paying taxes on and that should be done in a different way. So what MAPS has done is started a benefit corporation, wholly owned by MAPS, and it's going to be the 
organization that's going to market MDMA as a medicine once it happens. And the, the important thing here is that the goal of the benefit corporation is to maximize social benefit. And we're now developing a whole series of sort of ethical criteria on how we evaluate whether we are maximizing social benefit. So this is our response to the concerns about moving these drugs, psychedelics, marijuana, others, from a um, underground way to a commercialized approach, and we think that the profit maximization is not necessarily the way to go. So we're trying to not just model how to make psychedelics into medicines, but also how to market them in a way that's socially responsible. So there's no investors, no private gain, but it's still a, a wholly owned subsidiary of MAPS. And the idea is that uh, people make uh, d donations to MAPS, tax, receive a tax deduction, MAPS transfers the money to the benefit corporation, the benefit corporation does the, res the research, and then eventually the benefit corporation will um, sell the MDMA for slightly more than it costs us to make, and then we will use those resources to fund further research. Because the idea is trying to do a sustainable nonprofit. So it's um, a constant uh, challenge of mine and our fundraising staff to try to raise the resources that we need to do uh, the drug development. It'll probably cost around $20 million to make uh, MDMA into a prescription medicine. But then once that happens, over the f certain years, we'll be able to earn that and put that back into other research. So th the vision here is trying to make a sustainable nonprofit. And we're one of the few nonprofits that actually has a product at the end, you know, feeding the hungry or, or doing any number of service delivery things. It's just uh, something where you've got to constantly address a human need. But in our case, we're trying to make a product and we're trying to then move forward in that way. Now, how are we going to do this? Um, you know, it takes, uh, you, you hear the pharmaceutical companies and they'll tell you it takes over a billion dollars to make a drug into a medicine. And there's a variety of reasons why that doesn't really apply to MAPS's situation. And the first is that there's, if you go into Medline, which is the repository of scientific literature, um, on medicine, there's over 5,000 papers on MDMA or ecstasy, all in the public domain. So there's an enormous amount of information on the risks of MDMA. And we also have studies for post-traumatic stress disorder, and we, we felt like uh, MDMA is ideal for post-traumatic stress disorder, and generally people have sympathy for people with post-traumatic stress disorder, both veterans and others, and that that would be a way for us to um, try to um, appeal to the mainstream. So that is our top priority, MDMA for post-traumatic stress. We've completed a study in the United States and in Spain, and we have two studies in the United States underway now, one in Canada, one in Israel. And at the end of it, we will have treated around 90 people at a cost of around four and a half or $5 million. And that's gonna be happening at the end of this year. We will complete our phase two studies. And we've also started research into MDMA for social anxiety in autistic adults. And this was something that actually um, was like crowdsourced drug development. A bunch of young people mostly uh, went to raves, um, took ecstasy somewhere on the autistic spectrum, and then they said afterwards that it helped them to understand emotions and read body language and develop um, relationships in ways that they hadn't before. And uh, uh, Alicia Danforth did a PhD dissertation gathering all of this information together, contacting as many of the people as she could and, and finding out that this really does seem to be something that is working. And then we use that as data to go to the FDA to start the study. And then also building on some of the work that uh, Stan and, and others did with LSD for people who were uh, anxious about dying, who had life cancer and were anxious about dying, uh, we've sort of brought that back and we have a study for MDMA for people with end-of-life anxiety. And you may have heard about the work of Hefter that has worked with psilocybin for end-of-life related anxiety. So these are again, in a sense, anxiety-related disorders, but they're all uh, patient populations that um, the mainstream really wants to see getting more help. 
and we have a therapist training protocol. That's the most amazing part. We went to the FDA and we said, we would like to really train more therapists. We, we need to, to mainstream this, we need to train more therapists, but because it's a controlled substance, the only way we can do it is in the context of a protocol. And so we would like to develop a protocol where we could give MDMA to therapists. And the, the FDA said, well, we can't actually do that, but if you design a scientific experiment that gathers whatever you think is useful, we're going to um, let you limit who can be in the study to therapists in your training program. And we managed to get permission for that. And so we brought people from all over the world now. We can bring people into our training program and give them a legal MDMA session. So that's really the key. So that, that also shows, I think, that the regulatory agencies are really willing to put science over politics. And more importantly, we've had a effort since the late 1980s actually trying to reach out to the military. And this is a um, Senator uh, Jay Rockefeller, uh, former senator, didn't run for re-election from West Virginia. And he wrote to the Assistant Secretary of Defense for Health Affairs and says, I'm writing to encourage you to explore innovative treatments for PTSD, including but not limited to MDMA. And uh, that was well received, actually. Uh, this is a meeting in the Pentagon. Uh, this is Michael Mithofer, uh, our lead psychiatrist. Um, and then Richard Rockefeller, who has sort of been our champion, who tragically died in a plane crash about a year ago. And, but through the work of Richard and his cousin Jay, we really were able to build this bond with the uh, therapists involved in the Veterans Administration and coordinate with the Department of Defense. So I think that this is really part of what's been missing for so long is in terms of the mainstreaming of psychedelics. And now we have a study that we're about to complete with veterans with 24. The study was uh, 24 um, veterans, firefighters, and police officers. Now, I didn't actually think we'd get firefighters or police officers, but I wanted to put that in the title so that when we're sort of talking about what we're trying to do, we make it clear that it's not just for you know, aging hippies who you know, now have trauma, it's for veterans, but also for firefighters and, and police officers. And as it turned out, we have 20 veterans, three firefighters, and we actually even have one police officer with work-related trauma that we've been able to enroll. So what have we learned from all these studies? This is the key point. So we have been able to learn that in a therapeutic context, we can administer MDMA safely. There, nobody overheats, nobody has um, um, hyponatremia where they drink too much water, nobody has hyperthermia, nobody has, um, so far nobody has had really a psychotic reaction or anything like that. We've shown that in a therapeutic setting with pure MDMA to screen people that we can administer MDMA-assisted psychotherapy in a safe manner. We've also shown that the effect size, which is a statistical technique, that the efficacy is substantial and that we're working only with people who have failed on available treatments. We're working with chronic treatment-resistant PTSD, and we've shown that we have a very large effect size. And we've also shown that the cause of the PTSD doesn't matter. So our first study was mostly women survivors of childhood sexual abuse and adult rape and assault. And we switched then to trying to work with veterans with uh, combat-related PTSD. And we've also had people with work-related uh, accidents, with um, other causes of PTSD. And so it seems like our treatment is effective regardless of the cause of the PTSD. Once you are stuck in that place, it's the same disease. And what that means is that we can enroll anybody with PTSD in our studies. We don't have to limit it to um, certain people. And we've also learned that the double blind is very difficult to do <laughs> in psychedelic research. Um, most people can tell if you have a psychedelic or if you have an inactive placebo. And that's the methodologically, from the scientific point of view, that's the most difficult challenge. And so one of the things that um, I tried to do uh, initially was to do the opposite of the pharmaceutical industry. 
So we share everything. There's no intellectual property rights. Everything's in the public domain. But I missed a trick up until a few years ago, which is to hire retired FDA officials to be your advisor. So we've done that, and, and we have now hired the person who was the former director of the FDA Division of Psychiatry Products. And we brought him our data, and what he said is that the FDA realizes that in a lot of research, it's not really effective, this double blind, that there's side effect profiles, even in traditional medicines, a lot of times people can pierce the double blind. And he said, in, in our case, we were looking at dose response, uh, could we sort of use low dose MDMA versus high dose MDMA, and people would be confused, but then we would show that the uh, dose response was there, and that would be a way to do double blind. But we found that the low dose MDMA, 25, 30 milligrams, actually has an anti-therapeutic effect. That people get, uh, they're there to work on their trauma, they've been bothered by their trauma sometimes for decades, and then they get activated a little bit, but they don't get the support, and so it's more uncomfortable. And actually, we've had more people drop out at the low dose, and so that doesn't really work in terms of creating an effective double blind. But what we learned is that, from a scientific point of view, that random assignment, meaning everybody is similarly motivated, and then you randomly assign them to placebo or to the active dose, that's really crucial. The actual double blind isn't so crucial, and then the way in which you evaluate the outcomes by independent raters who don't know which groups the people are in, that's really crucial. So we've now figured out, with advice from the senior FDA retired official, how to design our phase three studies. So that's pretty much what we needed to learn. But we have, and this is just to show you the, uh, you can't see this, but the effect sizes here from our different studies are above one. And above 0.8 is a very, is a large effect size. So this suggests that we might actually be um, able to get this declared breakthrough therapy from the FDA, which means that they consider it a priority and will help us expedite. Now, what we still have to figure out exactly is what is the dose. And so in our study of dose response with, uh, it was um, 30 milligrams, 75 milligrams, and 125 milligrams. What really surprised us is that the 75 milligram dose group actually work better than even the 125. And the 125 milligram is considered to be a full dose, and that's what's mostly used in therapy, what's been used in our other studies. And that's led us to think about a, a new research in memory and called memory reconsolidation. So the idea is that as you um, remember something, that it comes from different parts of your brain, different aspects of the memory, and then once you've had that memory, you actually have to recreate, reconsolidate the memory. And in that process, the memories can change in certain ways. So that if you have a, a traumatic memory that you are remembering when you are feeling safe, the fear is not necessary. You can remember the incidents. You can learn from the incidents. And we find that under MDMA, people's memory for the trauma is enhanced. They remember a lot more than they ever did before about what happened. But when they reconsolidate the memory, it's from a position of feeling safe and supported. And that's a way, it seems like, to, for that people get better. And the Rockefeller family, in honor of Richard uh, and his interests, has donated money to Rockefeller University to some of the top scientists there to study exactly this, MDMA and memory reconsolidation theories. So it could be that at 125, you have more pleasurable feelings, you, people we notice have more mystical feelings, more, but those maybe are not as biographical as the 75 milligram dose, and maybe that's why it's more effective. However, some people do seem to need fuller doses, so we're still trying to figure out what is our phase three doses, and it's likely to be three MDMA sessions, scheduled three to five weeks apart, where the first one is 75 milligrams, and then the next one will be a choice between the therapist and the patient to go up to 125. And then the third one would be similarly 75 or 125. So we're still trying to play this, but play around with this, we'll look at our data, but this is the way it looks like we're going.
And we have um, several studies in development. Um, and this is, for us, very exciting in that um, the first study that we're doing in informal collaboration with the VA is um, a couples therapy. They've developed a, a, an approach where um, one of the couple has PTSD, but they, because it affects the relationship, they bring in both members of the couple, and then they do therapy with both of them. And so this is going to be a combination of cognitive behavioral conjoint therapy and MDMA. And for us, what's really exciting is that both members of the couple are going to get the MDMA. So this is the first time we're moving from just treating one person with a male-female co-therapist team to having actually a still two-person therapy team, but now both members of the couple will get MDMA. And eventually this could perhaps lead one day to uh, group therapy. And we'll see how that goes. Uh, and then the other thing that we're about to start is a study in um, a mechanism of action study in uh, the United Kingdom with veterans with PTSD and they're going to go in a scanner and they're going to talk about a trauma script and then a, a neutral script and then see how their brains react. And this is a way to uh, also, it's in a sense a minimal support therapy. So it's not a lot of therapy, it's support, and so we're trying to see what just the MDMA can do on its own and how. So we're going to finish our um, phase two studies in 2015. We're going to um, apply for breakthrough therapy designation. We're going to uh, have our end of phase two meeting in 2016 sometime, and, and early 2017 is when we hope to start phase three and we hope for FDA approval in 2021. So that, that's the big picture there. This is just to show you briefly uh, the results from our autistic adults um, study. You know, we don't know, we haven't broken the blind, but you can see that there's a differential. This studies with 12 people. This is the results from six. So one group is clearly doing better than the other. And so in addition to having really large effect sizes from the uh, MDMA PTSD, we think that the MDMA for autistic adults and reducing social anxiety is also working. And, and now we also have um, done some work on marijuana. And starting in 1992, actually, I tried to do research with um, medical use of marijuana and we've been blocked. So our role has been to try to do research on medical marijuana through the FDA, be blocked, and then other groups like the Marijuana Policy Project, Americans for Safe Access, Drug Policy Alliance, use the fact that we've not been able to succeed and said, okay, now we need state level reform. And I feel, like, I always felt like if the principle that we have right now is that psychedelics can be researched, we have obtained approval from regulatory agencies all over the world for the research with psychedelics. But as long as marijuana research was being blocked, I was worried it could always tip back and psychedelics could shut down again. And so I felt if we could open marijuana research, that would be really good. And what has actually happened is we finally succeeded. And so because of... Uh, and, and we actually got a $2 million grant from the state of Colorado to do a marijuana study with PTSD and 76 veterans. So it, it will help us build our expertise in PTSD, and it will also start marijuana. And we're also doing a small observational study with veterans that are going to ayahuasca experiences for PTSD. And we're finishing up research observational, again, studies with Ibogaine for opiate addiction. And we're looking at clinics in Mexico and New Zealand and showing how people are doing after that. Now, Sanjay Gupta covered our story, Weeds 3, uh, and it focused a lot on our, our study with marijuana for PTSD. Um, the, the remaining barrier to marijuana research is the government has a monopoly on the supply of marijuana. And this is, uh, this is a few years ago, but this is a picture of their crappy marijuana. And the, um, NIDA has given a $68 million grant to the uh, University of Mississippi to grow marijuana for research for the next five years. $68 million, 13.6 million every year. But that marijuana, they, they were at the time trying to block private production and saying that they could produce whatever was necessary. 
but their marijuana can only be used for research. It can't be used for prescription use. And so phase three studies have to be done with the same drug you want to market. So as long as the government has a monopoly, there is no way to make marijuana into a medicine in the United States. And so we're still trying to break this monopoly. And we've got a good, uh, this is what we'd like to grow. <laughs> And we have a good chance of actually doing that. And recently, the uh, Secretary of Health and Human Services ended a special review, a public health service review of marijuana protocols that existed only for marijuana. Now, we also have um, a separate project called Psychedelic Arzendo Project. Uh, this is psychedelic harm reduction. And so one of the things, again, that people, when we think about where is the resistance to medicalizing psychedelics and where is the support for prohibition, it's no longer people are going to use psychedelics, they're going to turn in, turn on, drop out, they're going to protest this and that. That has sort of faded, and now it's parents worried about their kids. And a lot of kids actually go to festivals all over the, the world and have a use of psychedelics, and some of them really aren't prepared for the depth of the experience, for the shadow, for the work that, um, that Stan is going to be talking about in the book. And so what we've decided to do is to try to model a post-prohibition world by providing psychedelic harm reduction services at festivals around the world that are pretty well known. So we've done, at Burning Man and others since 2012, we started this work actually in 2002, um, but the Zendo project is, is, itself is just since 2012, we've had over 10,000 volunteer hours of support for people having difficult experiences. And we've done it at Burning Man and uh, Bicycle Day and Envision uh, in Costa Rica, uh, Africa Burn. We've done it all over and it's working great. And it's so satisfying to tell, take people who are kind of scared and terrified, who normally would be tranquilized and ho hospitalized or arrested, and instead, in supportive care, help them to work through their difficult issues and oftentimes, you know, return to the party. This is the uh, Zendo itself, uh, constructed at Burning Man. Uh, this was our 20th anniversary celebration at Burning Man. Um, the, the four key principles are very similar to the principles of uh, psychotherapy, psychedelic psychotherapy. You know, create a safe space, Sitting, not guiding, meaning that the unconscious is the guide. We're not really guiding people. It's, it's coming from individuals unconscious. And then talk through, not talk down, meaning that we go into the problems. We don't run away from them. We encourage people to do it, but if they don't want to, it's okay. And then the, the key point, which is difficult, is not the same as bad. And so the Zendo project, I think, is a very important complement. And it's also where we train psychedelic psychotherapists because they can work on these projects and have a lot of people that, uh, that need help and they're surrounded by other therapists working in the same space and we can give each other feedback. And this is where we're all heading now. This is the uh, a network of MAPS psychedelic clinics. And once we have that, then I think it will um, grow. And the, the model here is the hospice movement. So in 1974 was the first hospice in 19... In, um, 2004, 30 years later, there was 3,500 of them in every community, practically. So I think we were going to move to psychedelic clinics in, in every community that has a hospice, and that once that happens, we'll be able to sort of move outside of that context and then have general end of prohibition. People will be able to have these experiences for personal growth, and then, oops, well, then, will end. <laughs> no, then, then I was going to say that, um, well, anyway, then that was a slide um, about the uh, Parliament of the World's Religions talking about peace. So I think we will move through medicine to spirituality and that will help us all pass on a much more uh, solid and beautiful world to the next generations coming after us. So, thank you.
Uh, I would like to now um, just introduce Stan and, and say that, um, you know, Stan was really my inspiration and my, um, my teacher in many ways. And, and so um, Stan has, um, going back to the uh, 1950s in Prague, was one of the early explorers of LSD, came in, coming from a traditional uh, psychiatric, psychotherapeutic, psychoanalytic background, and then having that sort of blown wide open by his experiences with LSD. And Stan has more experience than uh, almost anybody in the world sitting with people with uh, going through psychedelics, and has had the intellectual rigor to develop a new understanding of the unconscious based on the observations from the patients that he worked with. And then when um, the Russians came into um, the Czechoslovakia around 68, Stan was able to escape and come to the United States and then did really pioneering work um, at Johns Hopkins at the Maryland Psychiatric Research Center. And then when psychedelics were criminalized, and not just for non-medical use, but where research was ended all over the world, what Stan was able to do, um, in large part with his wife, Christina, was to find a way forward which involved breathing, which involved hyperventilation as a non-drug approach towards uh, producing very similar or identical kinds of experiences that were produced by psychedelics. So I, I felt like that that move there for me, the, the persistence and the, the wisdom that Stan and Christina showed to try to find a way forward within the constraints of the society was, was tremendous. And now there's uh, people practicing ultra breath work all over the world. And, Many people have said that their experiences with holotropic breath work are even deeper than their experiences with LSD. And I think that's because of the safe container that has been developed for breath work experiences. So while Stan was also doing that, he ended up being scholar in residence at Esalen and would have uh, workshops, week long, month long workshops, and then started the Transpersonal Association, the, the really transpersonal psychology, and then organized international conferences uh, all over the world that really built this uh, this sort of new vision of consciousness, new vision of the human being. And, and now Stan is uh, uh, going all over the world still, uh, training new therapists and, and sharing his vision. And so it's just a tremendous uh, good fortune that we have Stan with us tonight to share with you about his new book. question that has been in my mind for 50 years is why is the United States government suppressing research into certain medicines while at the same time allowing research into other medicines? Mendocino Coast, a place for rest, recovery, and well-being, inner calm and contentment, complete relaxation, heal chronic pain and disease, stretch your breath and your body, fun, laughter, and joy, your body's natural cleansing, present in the moment, licensed professional therapists and healers, on the coast at Dragonfly Wellness Center, one mile south of Highway 20 on Highway 1. 707-962-0890 www.dragonflywellness.org Green and 
Sober.org, a sober living environment using permaculture, arts and crafts, peer-to-peer support, medicinal cannabis to help get off of alcohol, drugs, and prescription medications. Away from the crowds where water and sky are clear, a spiritual awakening beckons. Guest chefs nourish you. Natural therapeutic benefits at Wilbur Hot Springs. WilburHotSprings.com I will try this, uh, but if you from the back you cannot see me, I'll stand. This is not just a geriatric uh, chair, I was just 84 years old, but I have had over the years number of uh, interventions on my, on my veins, for, for uh, varicose veins, so it's not good for me to stand for an hour. Is it okay, like this? I got a lot of uh, positive feedback and strokes from, from Rick, and I have to return the favor. Uh, I feel tremendous, tremendous uh, admiration for what Rick has done uh, with his uh, staff, with MAPS, uh, in terms of uh, uh, reverting somehow the history and uh, uh, being responsible for what's now a global renaissance of, of interest in, in psychedelics between many, many different uh, countries uh, of the world. Uh, I had the tremendous privilege to spend three weeks with Rick in uh, Israel and I saw him operating. Uh, it was just about every hour was filled with something. We were meeting psychologists, psychiatrists, politicians, uh, biologists, you know, we had uh, evening for uh, Raphael Mechura, who is the, the um, Albert Hoffman of Israel, the one who isolated the THC. And it's amazing to see Rick in action and realizing that this has been going for decades now and, uh, you know, bringing enormous uh, results. So, Christine and I saw him uh, growing from this very enthusiastic but somewhat uh, uh, undisciplined uh, youngster to, uh, you know, uh, somebody who went through uh, political studies, uh, psychological studies, you know, interacting on the government on different levels, going to Pentagon. So it has been quite, quite amazing to, uh, to watch him. I'm also extremely uh, grateful for the publication of this book. Uh, this has been written many years ago. Uh, but uh, there were problems because there are so many, so many pictures and it was very expensive to publish in color. And so I'm very grateful to uh, Rick and to, to MAPS, uh, particularly Sarah and uh, Brad, who is a kind of lion's share in, in bringing this book out. Um, and I also very much appreciate this amazing uh, uh, you know, energy and, and love and time that went into organizing this uh, this event, which I think is quite quite unique. I'd like to thank all of you for showing in such incredible numbers, sort of it's very very unexpected. So what I would like to use my time for is two things. I would like to explain to you what my intention was in publishing uh, this book, which goes really beyond. Uh, the topic which is expressed in the in the title and the subtitle and then would like to share with you some uh, personal histories with both with Albert Hoffman and with Hans Ruedi Giger who the, you know the major inspirations for this uh, for this book so I started uh, as a as a psychiatrist you know, inspired very much by Freud uh, for it was the reason why I 
went to, to study psychiatry. It was my original intention was to work in animated movies. You know, I realized that I ultimately didn't go that far from my original uh, profession, <laughs> different kind of uh, movies. Uh, but anyway, it was reading Freud that really uh, inspired me to study, study medicine. But I got to the point where I became very disappointed with Freud, not uh, initially with the um, theory, but mostly the practice, you know, how long it takes, how much energy, how much, how much money. And I realized that even after years, the results were not exactly breathtaking. My own analysis, you know, lasted uh, seven years, three times a week. And if, we, if you ask me, did it change you? I said, well, I changed, you know, but seven years is a long, uh, a long time, it probably changed anyway. And uh, I loved every, every minute of my psychoanalysis, finding, you know, the deep meaning in dreams and in slips of the tongue. Um, but I had to realize this was not a solution for, for psychiatry. The estimate at the time was that your average analyst can see 80 patients in a lifetime. So that's not going to, you know, change very much the situation in the, in the world where there's increasing number of emotional uh, psychosomatic problems. So in the situation where I was experiencing crisis and I was sort of nostalgically thinking back about the animated movies, this would have been much, much more interesting career than where psychiatry was going. Um, in the psychiatric department when I was working got a supply of LSD from, from Sandoz. It came with a, with a letter describing uh, Albert's uh, you know, serendipitous uh, discovery, his uh, kind of fortuitous uh, intoxication, accidental uh, intoxication. And also the, the study that followed, the study of his boss's uh, son, Stoll, who did the pilot study, the initial pilot study, and um, LSD became a sensation in the world. Very few people even today know that this sensation was not the discovery of the psychedelic effects because mescaline was already um, um, isolated in a pure form from, from Beyote and there were three decades of intense experimentation with mescaline. It was initially the incredible power, which is about a thousand times uh, more than, uh, than mescaline. You know, 100 milligrams of mescaline equals about, about uh, 100 micrograms of, uh, of LSD. So we got this uh, sample of, uh, of LSD from, uh, from Sandoz, and they were suggesting uh, that we could explore two different avenues uh, or venues. The one was um, using it as an experimental psychosis, where we can give it to quote-unquote normal people and do all kinds of uh, studies, psychological tests, uh, biochemical tests, electrophysiological tests and so on, and find out what is happening in the body at the time when the psyche is so profoundly uh, influenced. And so it's great to have a model in science. But there was a second little note, little tip that kind of became my karma or my destiny. And they suggested that maybe LSD could be used as a kind of unconventional uh, educational tool that psychiatrists, psychologists, nurses, students could take it and spend a few hours in the world that seemed to be very similar to in the world of uh, their patients. And so at that time I was really disappointed with psychoanalysis. I became one of the early subjects in Prague and uh, I had an experience which, which changed my life uh, professionally uh, as well as personally. So I mentioned that uh, I questioned, you know, how much I changed in seven years of psychoanalysis. If you ask me about LSD, I would say, well, I was one person when I walked into that session and somebody else walked out in the evening and there was no doubt in me, you know, what, what did it? I mean, what, what, what were the causal relations there? And so I ended up, uh, um, the, the passion for studying uh, non-ordinary states or, or a very significant subgroup of, 
non ordinary states, which I call now holotropic. Holos means whole, and trapein, trapo means uh, moving towards. So uh, these are states that have, uh, in my experience, therapeutic uh, potential, they have transformative potential, they have heuristic, H E U R, which means if we study them, uh, we obtain revolutionary new material about the human psyche, about consciousness, and even the, the nature of uh, reality. So I now spent over 50 years studying these holotropic, holotropic states. Uh, now I went into this work uh, equipped with um, medicine, very, very materialistic medicine, because I studied medicine when we had a Marxist regime, we were controlled by the by the Soviet Union, uh, and then equipped with Freudian analysis, where the idea is that the psyche somehow is limited to postnatal biography and to the individual unconscious. In other words, the, the newborn, according to Freud, is tabula rasa, is a clean slate. There's nothing of interest uh, for psychologists, for psychiatrists that precedes birth, including birth itself. Now, this is still a present model in psychiatry, which is unbelievable if you think about it. This start, the psychological history starts after we are born. Uh, there's no memory of birth. Now, the reason that's uh, given for that is that uh, the cortex of the newborn is not myelinized. Well, that same argument is not used for the importance of nursing experiences. Everybody agrees, I think, in depth psychology that nursing makes a big difference. But even bonding, which is an exchange of looks between the mother and the child, is seen as something that can influence the, the entire relationship of the mother and the child for the rest of that person's, that born person's uh, life. So the idea is, in current psychiatry, is uh, we go through hours uh, of birth of a life-death struggle frequently or even die in the birth canal and be, be reborn and it's not recorded anywhere, the, uh, the fetus doesn't notice that something strange is happening and then instantly after being born becomes this uh, extremely sensitive to looks into his mother's eyes and, uh, and uh, to nuances of nursing. This unbelievable logical gap, which cannot be explained only as, as denial, as psychological repression. There's no other explanation for it. We have now um, a lot of prenatal research showing sensitivity of the fetus already in the, in the womb. Uh, we also know that you don't need a cortex at all to have memory. You know, Eric Kendall got a Nobel Prize for studying memory mechanisms in Aplesia, which is a sea slug. So sea slugs have memories, but newborns don't have memories because their cortex is not myelinized. So um, I started doing this uh, research with LSD, equipped with traditional uh, psychiatric uh, theory and, uh, and psychoanalysis. None of them recognizes psychological significance of anything that precedes birth, including birth itself. Birth is not a psychotrauma, according to uh, current psychiatry, unless it's so bad that it damages irreversibly the, the brain cells. Just sort of going, you know, for 50 hours through the birth canal is not a psychotrauma. Uh, so, um, when I started using LSD, this had to be corrected. You know, initially I was very incredulous, I think. I think this, this, uh, all these very famous professors that have written books, and so, they, they cannot be wrong. I must be sort of, there must be something wrong with my observations. But then I had the experiences myself and it became just absolutely obvious that there is a powerful record, record of, of birth. And then as we continued, it opened up uh, further. It went into what uh, Jung called the collective unconscious, you know. Uh, episodes from other centuries, sometimes with a sense of uh, personal remembering, déjà vu, déjà, déjà vécu, uh, experiences that come from the archetypal unconscious, mythological uh, figures and mythological realms from um, uh, 
cultures that we might not know in intellectually. We have access in these uh, holotropic states to this incredible range of uh, experiences, uh, which actually are um, very similar to what you find in the great spiritual philosophies of the East. You find it in Hinduism, in Buddhism, in Taoism, you find it in, in uh, Sufism and so on. So I started uh, writing books about these observations. There's a need to expand the cartography, the model of the, uh, of the psyche, the roots of emotional problems don't reach just to infancy and childhood. They reach to birth and through birth to uh, the, the trans, what we call now transpersonal level, to, to karmic experiences, to archetypal experiences, to phylogenetic uh, experiences. Uh, so this was in, in different uh, different books, and then when I was approaching my 70th birthday, uh, Jane Bunker, who was my editor at uh, SUNY Press, uh, called me and said, Stan, you know, we have published different books on different aspects of different observations from the work with non ordinary states. Would you uh, write one book that would kind of bring it together? something that would also uh, serve as an introduction for people who want to read these books. And then there was like a pause and then she said, and would you specifically focus on experiences that current psychiatry and psychology cannot explain? Okay, and then there was an even longer uh, break and then she said, and would you just sketch out what psychology would look like if you integrate these, these observations from from these holotropic states. So, um, this was a tall order, as you can imagine, but I was very excited because I was about to retire or semi-retire to do more reading and, and writing. And we have now the uh, training, holotropic breathwork happening all over the world. And we needed some kind of manual so that people by and large teach the same kind of things. And this was an offer from SUNY Press to, to write this kind of book. So I wrote it and I gave it a deliberately provocative uh, title, The Psychology of the Future. If, if you write books like Beyond the Brain or Spiritual Emergency, or you know, uh, people can take it or leave it. If you say this is psychology of the future, then people you know, would pay attention. They, well, that's what I thought, they would pay attention either get excited about it or get pissed, you know, how you dare, what do you think you are? Um, but I was, you know, absolutely convinced about the relevance of these observations because they were not just mine. There's a whole transpersonal community, my colleagues, you know, who have essentially the same kind of observations showing that, that current psychiatry is, is superficial as a, as a model that, uh, that uh, doesn't reflect uh, reality, it's, it's, that the human psyche is limited to what happens to us after we are born, and that the roots of emotional psychosomatic problems and interpersonal problems reach only to infancy uh, and childhood. There's nothing sort of below that. So anything that the, the current model doesn't capture is automatically labeled as, uh, as pathology. It's, it's some kind of a uh, process that's operating in the brain that generates this whole spectrum of transpersonal experiences and, and perinatal and perinatal uh, experiences. So I felt that we really need to a profound religion, a revision of uh, sorry, <laughs> good slip. Uh, we have, um, profound revision of, uh, of psychiatry. And unless this revision happens, unless we expand our, our concept of what the psyche is and how, <coughs> how big it is, what the dimensions of the psyche are, what the potential of the human psyche, that our understanding of emotional psychosomatic problems would be superficial, that our therapy would be ineffective, increasingly focusing on suppressing of symptoms rather than looking why the symptoms appear, where they are coming, coming from. And that also the academic community will not be able to accept psychedelics 
You know, how can you heal people by inducing experiences that current psychiatry considered to be pathology? You see, this the, the, the transformation and the healing in psychedelic sessions happens through experiences of psycho-spiritual death rebirth, through past life experiences, through archetypal experiences. None of that is seen as a normal cartography of the, of the psyche. So that once you reach beyond that biographical realm, those experiences would be labeled as psychotic and they would be uh, suppressed. Whereas if you have that larger map and you have a supportive environment where these experiences can, can emerge, it, they turn out to be transformative. They turn out to be healing, much more powerful therapeutically than anything that current psychiatry has to, has to uh, offer. And it really goes to the, to the core of the problem. It's not just dealing with the symptoms the way current uh, psychopharmacology uh, deals with. Uh, so I have written about this, uh, but there's really not much response except paraprofessionally. There's a lot of, a lot of uh, sort of quite enthusiastic acceptance of this larger model in people who have done some self-experimentation or have done some uh, some work with uh, clients uh, paraprofessionally, but it has not uh, really had much impact on on. Uh, the thinking in academic uh, circles. So I uh, refer to it frequently as one of the most un unsuccessful, history's most unsuccessful attempts at changing the, the paradigm. I just realized the other day that it was uh, 50 years ago, over 50 years ago, that I for the first time uh, presented this model, this birth model with the four, four perinatal matrices. I'm going to show it to you now. Okay, so this is, this is what I put together about uh, now 54 years ago on the basis of observations from uh, psychedelic sessions where it became obvious that people would not just regress into infancy and childhood but that the regression would go further and that they would get access to powerful emotions and, and powerful physical sensations that were coming from the memory of birth. And I noticed that the experiences were coming in four, uh, what I call perinatal uh, matrices, experiential matrices, and uh, that these uh, experiential clusters are related to consecutive stages of birth. And I started calling them uh, basic perinatal matrices or, or BPM. And then beyond that was uh, then opening into uh, this realm that we now call transpersonal. And initially for many people, uh, the, the fetal, the perinatal was actually mixed with the transpersonal. Uh, for example, let me just say a few words about this, uh, this model. So the first matrix is related to the situation where the uh, fetus is still in the womb in an advanced stage of pregnancy prior to the onset of the delivery. And people have the experiences of the quality of this womb. Is this a good womb or is it a bad womb? There are prenatal experiences where the maternal organism actually attacks the fetus, some RH incompatibility, or the mother has some kind of uh, uh, toxic problems or uh, you know, emotional uh, turmoil or living in a terrible, terrible marriage or being, being alcoholic and so on. Uh, now, whether this is a good womb or bad womb, then come nine months, plus minus, this changes and we have biochemical changes that are then translated into um, mechanical contractions of the uterus. And for a significant period of time, you have uh, contractions of the uterus, but the cervix is not open, so that there's no supply of oxygen, there is no supply of nourishment for the time of the of the contractions and there is no um, discharge of metabolic products. Very uncomfortable kind of a no exit uh, state. Some of the worst experiences that people can have in psychedelic sessions. OK, 
okay, I'm getting some signals. Okay. Uh, so this, this could be then mixed, for example, with archetypal experiences of hell, being in a, in a hellish situation, no exit situation. Emotional, physical suffering without any possibility of hope, of resolution. And then uh, the next stage is when the cervix is open, then there is still struggle to free oneself, but there is, a, there is an opening, there is a hope, there is a potential. And then, then we have the experience of uh, coming through and uh, being born. Now the other thing that came out of this uh, work was the concept of coexistence. I found out that the traumatic experiences are not uh, recorded in uh, the unconscious as a kind of mosaic of disconnected uh, elements, but that they form certain constellations, layered constellations. Let's say in asthma, you can have a coex, which is a uh, choking coex. There could be experience of near drowning when you were seven. There could be experience of being repeatedly choked by your siblings when you were four. Then maybe whooping cough when you were two. Then experience of being stuck in the birth canal uh, during uh, delivery. And then maybe a past life experience that involves choking or, or or being hanged or something like that. So this is very important. I am using this, this kind of principle when I am uh, uh, working with Hans Ruedi uh, Giger's uh, uh, biography. If you can see the material in his paintings related to these matrices, particularly the, the second, the third matrix, and then also memories from his life that uh, create this kind of layered constellations, what I call the COEX system, or the systems of condensed experience. Now, um, when I was sort of struggling with this, uh, with this perinatal material, uh, I dis discovered this book in a <laughs> bookstore in Santa Cruz, Necronomicon. And then I opened it, and this was all these images that I was dealing with in my own psychedelic sessions and in the, in the sessions of the clients that I was working with. And those are the, these kinds of images that you will see in the, in the book. Okay. And suddenly there was somebody here, there was a visionary who was able to portray certain dark uh, areas in the human psyche that current psychiatry cannot accept. We are very meek, uh, psychology where we have problems with nursing and, uh, and toilet training and so on, then we are surprised when suddenly there's Nazism or suddenly there's a, you know, a communism or things that happened in Tibet, things that happened in Syria. That doesn't come from nursing, that doesn't come from uh, toilet training. You know, there is, a, there is an area in the psyche, the, the perinatal and then even the deeper, the archetype, powerful, archetypes and so unless we diagnose the problem we don't have much chance of, of changing it if we're fooling ourselves that the problem is much more superficial that it will be not not much hope so he is painting these kinds of images he was very much aware of the fact that he was tapping his own memories of birth his mother and child caught in the situation where they're hurting each other and there is no way out when the cervix is not yet open. And then he has, uh, you know, he, his R is, is called bio, uh, biomechanoid, which is a, a mixing anatomical element and mechanical element, which is the nature of birth. It's happening in the human organism, but there's something very mechanical, that, uh, the pressures, the torques, and so on. We're talking about the death delivering machines, birth uh, delivering machines, and so on. So I, I don't have time to go into the, you, you find it in the book. Uh, I'm getting signals that I'm taking uh, more time than I was supposed to. So this is uh, kind of a Kali type uh, uh, figure that uh, you, can, you can encounter in connection with, with birth. You can see also the combination of the human anatomy and also very mechanical um, elements, things that can that are sharp, that can hurt you. You can see the head here, 
Can you, Mike, covering it for you? There's a, there's a head in a vice uh, at the bottom. Again, the Kali type of figure. So these are these uh, images that I saw in the Necronomicon, and also elements of death rebirth identification with Christ on the cross and so on, which are the typical perinatal images. The boa constrictor type of uh, loops and also the elements of uh, crucifixion again. Okay, this, I'm just going to go through a few, uh, few personal memories here. Am I blocking it from, for you? Should I move? No, Okay, so uh, this was a visit uh, in uh, the Giger House in Erlikon in, in Zurich. This is Rick Tarnas on the, on the left side. It's a brilliant astrologer. It's a whole other chapter is uh, the significance of uh, archetypal astrology for the work with non-ordinary states. Uh, to his uh, left is Carmen. She was, uh, uh, she's the one who was supposed to be here. Uh, his wife, and uh, this is Hans Rudi Giger himself, and this is furniture that he designed for uh, Khodorovsky, uh, Khodorovsky's Dune. He, at the end, didn't uh, get the job, but had his paintings and the, the furniture that he designed. This is what his house looked like, crowded with uh, paintings, you know, these great paintings that you find in the book, uh, uh, in a very prominent place, but here they were like in the corner, sort of, and, uh, you know, topsy-turvy kind of in the, in the house. Uh, there's no, there were no uh, uh, windows, or if there were windows, there were curtains uh, covering them. It's like a sort of a second matrix uh, atmosphere. Now, he, as a, as a child, he um, went to annual, uh, annual uh, fair where they had a ghost ride, and he loved it, and as an adult he created one in his garden. And this is what he took me for a, for a ride. And I'll tell you the, some of the perinatal images that you see when you, when you go uh, for this ride. This is absolutely in one of his better days. And this, now we're bringing Albert Hoffman uh, into it, at the time when he discovered LSD. This is the Maryland Psychiatric Research Center where we did, uh, in Baltimore, where we did the research. And Albert uh, visiting, and in the middle is Walter Penke, who did the famous uh, Good Friday experiment, and Helen Bonin, the music therapist. Uh, this was a training module for holotropic breathwork that we did in near Basel, and we invited Albert for a, for a day to spend with our group. This was a visit probably 25 years ago in their beautiful home in uh, Berg, on the Swiss-French border. This was Anita, his, his wife. And this uh, fourth person is Christina. Uh, we are in, uh, in uh, Hoffmann Garden. And uh, the paintings of these two people are in, in the book. They are uh, Roberto Venosa and Martina Hoffman, they're visionary painters, focusing on the positive side, on the light side, you know, the visionary, beautiful images. And uh, Anthuridi is on the other uh, side. He is the absolute master of the sort of claustrophobic nightmare, perinatal nightmare, the bad tricks. Uh, and so we brought them together in their home. <laughs> they really represent the two poles. Now this was another uh, module of, uh, that we had, uh, which was in the Grier Museum, Grier Castle, where he has this uh, museum. And we invited Albert again for a day, and in Hansruhe is showing him his uh, his paintings. You can see the incredible scale of them. These are big paintings. And uh, when I was uh, sort of studying his style, it was amazing. He, was, he actually channeled these. He, he had a big canvas and he started in the left 
upper corner. He didn't know what he was doing, no, no sketches, no outline. And he just had that uh, um, airbrush and he would sort of, uh, you know, push the, push the little lever and these things started creating themselves. You can see him painting actually in a, a documentary that was just released, it's called Dark Star. So we were showing this to Albert and we were a little worried because he had such a refined aesthetic taste, but he was really very impressed. And it's expressed in this panel, this is uh, Tef Sparks, the director of the training, holotropic breathwork training. And we had this panel. Uh, Albert at that time was uh, four months to his 100th birthday. He was still very, very active. Uh, intellectually, and he was specifically interested in studying the uh, chemical composition of the pigments of flowers and uh, of butterfly wings. Uh, that was, listening to it was like, you know, Darshan was a good Indian guru. <laughs> and this, for this module we invited Alex uh, Gray and uh, Alison Gray. Alex's paintings are also in the, in the book. And this is the uh, end of the module, this is uh, the entry into the museum in Gruyere. And this is again Carmen on the right side. This was the goodbye, so he's almost 100 years old here. And this is then four months later, when I went back to Basel. And this was the official celebration of his 100th birthday. There's a Carmen on the right side again. Now this, this is now two years into the future. It was a, a psychedelic forum, a conference in Basel. He still was on the on the program, and it turned out that he didn't feel very well. So invited several of us to spend an afternoon with him, rather than going to the conference, which we didn't didn't mind. So what you see here is now four weeks before his death at the age of 102. And this is the last photograph that we have, and he's. Uh, holding a book by Alex Gray. So, so I've used all my time. So thank you. Thank you very much. This concludes the live presentation of Psychedelic Art Gallery, Modern Consciousness Research and the Understanding of Art which also launches Dr. Stan Groff's latest book, The Visionary World of A. Sharp Geiger. Our live streaming of this event is a production of Mind, Body, Health, and Politics and Mendocino TV. We hope this evening has been as illuminating for you as it has been for us. It certainly has been a wonderful experience and an educational one for me. I've been in this uh, field of psychology for 50 years, and there was plenty to learn here tonight. Each of the more than 400 people in attendance tonight is a participant in the reshaping of human consciousness. Here in the United States, we're seeing a groundswell towards the end of marijuana prohibition, which is encouraging many towards the possibility of our seeing the end of our government's suppression of scientific research into psychedelic medicines. An end that many of us hope that we'll be around to see. Certainly, events like this in a, could you move that faster, thanks, in a prestigious venue like this, in a city like this, is an indication of how much these ideas have advanced since the decades-long suppression of information began. A full recording of this event will be made available on our new audio-video platform, psychopedia.org. It'll be there along with a full interview and clips with Dr. Rick Doblin, whom you heard tonight, discussing research related to MDMA, Ibogaine, marijuana, LSD, and more. The entire series of interviews with national scientific experts on psychedelic medicines have been indexed by substance and topics on psychopedia.org. So go to that website and you can hear all the programs. By the way, I want to make a personal comment here and give my sincere thanks and gratitude to Dr. Rick Doblin and Dr. Stan Groff for their contribution to the field of science of psychedelic medicines and to all of us for the health benefits that someday we will get. 
Thank you again for joining us. This is Dr. Richard Miller reminding you that good health is worth fighting for, and I believe it's essential for life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Sober.org, a sober living environment using permaculture, arts and crafts, peer-to-peer -peer support, medicinal cannabis to help get off of alcohol, drugs, and prescription medications. Away from the crowds where water and sky are clear, a spiritual awakening beckons. Guest chefs nourish you. Natural therapeutic benefits at Wilbur Hot Springs. WilburHotSprings.com <laughs> 